What's up, YouTubers and Amazonians? My name is John Meyer, and welcome to another edition of the AWS Blogger. Today, we're chatting with AWS Chief of Evangelist, Jeff Barr. Are you looking to become an AWS Evangelist? If you want to learn more about mentoring the next generation of AWS Evangelists, working backwards with 2020, reInvent, and Jeff Barr, then you won't want to miss a moment of this video. Before I bring Jeff onto the show, if you want to see more videos, with chats with various Amazonians, including an upcoming one with AWS VP of Technology, Bill Vaz. Don't forget to smash that like, subscribe, and notification button. Please welcome Jeff Barr. Thanks for joining us. Happy to be here, John. Jeff, I'm so glad that we get a chance to sit down and do these periodically. It, it's definitely a pleasure to have you on the show and do recordings as well as some of the other things we're doing. And I know you're so busy and I really like your sunrise right there in the background. I, I really like this picture too. So I, I've actually become something of an expert at predicting when we're going to have good sunrises here in Seattle. There, there's a certain height of height and density of clouds. And when I see them, I'm like, okay, get the camera ready. We're going to have a beautiful sunrise today. Uh, I think you might have to do a blog post on that one, on just predicting the sunrises and uh, seeing how well you're doing on capturing them and uh, progression over time. It's it's kind of um, human machine learning, I guess, because there's just there's a certain pattern that you see and you say, okay, this is this is it, this is going to happen. I, I had a lot of compliments and and questions about like what really expensive camera I'm using, and the funny thing is, it's actually just my phone. Oh, you know what? The latest phones and how they capture a lot of the videos and cameras and, you know, you kind of see the uh, advertisements on how they're making movies with just the videos, the phones yep. themselves are amazing. They, they actually are. And it's almost funny that the, the word phone is becoming obsolete because phone calls are usually like the, the fourth or fifth, like most frequent <laughs> thing that you do with them, right? They're, 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 they're cameras, they're their digital communication devices, their storage, their messaging, and they go, oh yeah, by the way, you can actually do voice calls on them <laughs> as well. <laughs> and that's gonna be a thing in the past. Hey, you know that phone? No, 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 that's not a phone. That's a digital portable media device. Exactly. So Jeff, I know we were scheduled to sit down last week and do this recording. I had a reschedule. I felt really bad. Thursday, I wasn't feeling well. I have to let you know, you know, Tuesday, my wife and I did get tested just in case because she wasn't feeling as well. I'm happy to say her results came back negative. I got mine this morning. My results were positive. Oh, no. Sorry to hear that. Yeah, it's actually very interesting, um, you know, the feeling, and I don't want to downplay any of it because everybody experiences symptoms differently or how their body reacts to it. I have to say I'm a, one of the lucky ones uh, for it. And the reason I'm saying that is because, you know, in the mornings, I, I feel great, to be honest with you. Uh, then afternoons, I get a little slight headache. And then probably throughout the day, I have a little nauseated feeling. Other than that, uh, I, I'm riding my Peloton daily still. It's mm. really not stopping me with that. I do have to take some deep breaths occasionally, so you'll hear that. But other than that, um, I feel kind of lucky. Stay strong and we'll, we'll send positive thoughts your way. I'm very fortunate that the kids don't seem affected at all. We've been isolating for, we're actually past 10 days now. We're going to do 14 or more. We're just going to play it safe and just uh, be precautious for everybody. Mm. Well, what a weird time of the world we live in with, with having to think about all these things and do, do all these unusual things. You know what, uh, that, that's correct. And, you know, speaking of that one, you know, one of the topics here where is we're taking a look at 2020 and working backwards. And I think of myself in the beginning of 2020, there were so many events going on, so much things I had planned for 2020 and to do that changed, everything changed for everybody. And you and I really got started around AWS Deep Racer time. And I, I kind of want to touch back on that because it's a turning point in my career, something I didn't think about, think I was going to do. But I started hosting AWS Deep Racer events here in my basement, and you joined us for the championships. That, that was a lot of fun. And I, I don't know, something that has happened the last year is really uh, the value of experimentation. And you, you get some interesting idea, and you say, well, the, 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 the things I used to do, I can't do them anymore. I can't hop on a plane. I can't go visit customers. I can't go to these live events. And what can I do instead? And for, for a little bit, I, I felt like we had to be apologetic for the fact that, oh, I'm, I'm very, very sorry, but I can't be there. And I'm very sorry, but I have, I'm only able to deliver to you 
low quality video. And after a couple of months, we said, you know what? F forget the apologies. We're, we're now in our own element. We, we have full control of everything that happens. We, we can choose where we sit and how we sit, and we can set up our, our lights and our cameras, and we can not have to worry about going halfway around the world and, and being jet lagged. And as a speaker, you know that the hosts do their absolute best to make sure everything is awesome, but you, you step up to the podium and it's like, oh, I have VGA and you've got digital video, or what do you mean I can't see my laptop screen while I'm speaking? How am I gonna actually know what I'm supposed to talk about? <laughs> um, a million different surprises, hardly any of them are upside surprises. They're all, oh, by the way, we forgot to tell you this, or, or you had a 30 minute speaking slot, but everybody behind you was running late. So you're, you're 30 minutes, they're like, can you, can you compress it down to 22 minutes? So, so now we've, we've got more control and more options. And I, I, if, if I take a lesson from 2020, it was how much can you do from where you are and just really take advantage of that. I, I, I put together my list of how much I managed to, to do remotely. And I, I made effectively virtual appearances in like almost every corner of the world this last year. Yeah, I, I agree with you on a lot of that on, I think one of our topics that we talked about was the very first thing we need to do, and you said this, and it, it, it resonates with me, is that we need to admit the time we're in. We need to admit to ourselves that this is real. We need to admit to ourselves that it's okay to be, you know, feel this way. And then only then can we really change. And I think taking a lot of that is 2020 was a time for reinventing things. And excuse the pun, but in, in a way, we are... We started out, you know, doing some very low quality streams. And I think just everybody else was just getting better. We were getting, we we're fine tuning our craft. We were able to actually deliver more and better quality during this time. And it was a forceful, but an interesting change. I, I think so. And sometimes we think of change as this optional thing we can do to take advantage of opportunities, but evolution isn't really like that. Evolution sometimes puts you in a situation where it's either survive or not survive. And I think we looked at this and said, we, we can we can not just survive, but we can actually, in addition to surviving, we can actually really like maximize and thrive in this environment. You know, 2020 was definitely challenging and everybody's looking forward to 2021 here. But I take a look back at it and, you know, everybody experienced it differently. We all had our challenges and I'm trying to take the positives out of it. And one of the positives is, I, I found a huge passion for recording, evangelizing, you know, doing these live streams, these chats, and Deep Racer itself. And I don't think I would have found that actually traveling to all these locations that I was going to do and help out with Deep Racer. That passion probably might have taken a back seat as I was working on, you know, other goals. Yeah, and I, I think that that's how, for, for both of us, this, this past year, we, we learned so much about all the, these tricks and tools of the trade of streaming from where do you sit and how do you sit and how do you set up your camera and your lights? And we learned all these amazing tools. The funny thing is I still feel like we're, it, it's such an incredibly fun learning journey that I still feel like I'm on step one of this, this journey. Um, you know what? It's almost like Amazon mentality day one while we are in step one of the journey. And I, I think as long as we stay in step one, you're always going to have that mentality of, of improving it, fine tuning it and really honing some of those skills. Yeah, I, I, I actually gave a talk last night to uh, to groups in Hong Kong and Taiwan. I, I, I was literally sitting here in the same chair and I, I gave a, a talk that I call it's called um, rethink, reinvent, rebuild. And just talking about, about the, everything has changed and what, what are the challenges, what are the opportunities, what, what can we do better, what can we do differently? And I, I really try to make it a very hopeful, optimistic talk that says, okay, everything's weird, everything's difficult, but we're now in this interesting situation where I think the, the, the world and the audience is perhaps a bit more receptive to experimentation on the part of, of any, anybody that's doing anything for the public. The, the world understands that you're in a difficult situation. If you, if you run a restaurant, well, everything has changed for running a restaurant from that you used to be able to do this great branded experience in your restaurant. Well, around here, it's mostly takeout. They've, they've turned into, they, they've done a little bit to say, well, under very special circumstances, you can, you can have these little like 
either open air seating or you can have these little pods where people like little groups sit in pods. Well, it's yes, you had to do it, but it's now this kind of innovation as far as I'm concerned. So I, I look at these things as innovations rather than as as band-aids or crutches. That's actually interesting. So I had a chance and uh, you actually kind of circled back on that one. Uh, a little bit is I had the chance to go back out uh, to Seattle, my very first flight, my very first trip since uh, March in December for reInvent. And I did AWS Deep Racer Underground mm -hmm. at, in Seattle mm -hmm. in Oscar. We dubbed it Oscar Loop. And Jeff, you were the track boss for that. You joined us for a very special event. Uh, we had like three people there. It was live streamed. It was by far awesome. And I got to, well, before I say anything, if if you guys want to take a look at Jeff Barr's Track Boss recording, take a look up here. I'll include the link to it, which is awesome. And Jeff, I really appreciate you joining us for that event, by the way. No, it was really fun. I've still got my special <laughs> Track Boss socks for, for the, the Deep Racer um, Surface, the, the anti-slip socks. Yeah, yeah, and the mask. Don't forget yeah, the mask. Go. My wife made me one personally for travel, so I had to deep brace her mask. I had to deep brace her jacket on. I was full decked out in the swag. But uh, going back to Seattle, I was only in my hotel room, so I had delivery. That was it. Now, I did do some walking around and stretch my legs a little bit, but it was definitely a different experience. And now it also kind of resonates that we're not the only ones experiencing where you're at. When you see and you go to other cities, you see that it, this is a global thing. It, it absolutely is. And again, we're going to look back on this and say, wow, that was that was a weird year or 18 months or two years. We, we don't actually know yet. And we're going to come out the other side, I think, stronger, maybe a little bit more innovative, maybe a little bit more respect for, for science and saying, OK, well, when when scientists and, and health professionals tell us something, we should really actually pay attention to what they have to say. That's actually a very good point, because, you know, you only hear about it and you only think about it locally. So you're only experiencing it yourself. But when everybody's saying it globally, then, you know, you, you got to kind of take that into a little bit of a consideration there yeah. that, you know, if we all take those precautions, we'll be much better off. I find it fascinating that the stories I see on the news about mask compliance and apparently in some cities and some populations, wearing a mask is a controversial thing. And here in Seattle, even even there, there's many days that I will be out walking my dog before six in the morning and we're, we're, we're in we're in the city here. But the, the number of people I will walk past at 5.30 or 6 a.m. that are also walking their dogs or they're, they're, they're running, everybody's masked up here. We, we've got really strong compliance, and I, I feel very safe walking on the streets early in the morning. It doesn't take much to just put it on. and it, it, It's a normal thing right now, and it shouldn't be really much of a, of a question. Yeah, I, it, it baffles me that this could be seen as some massive intrusion on personal freedom when... I'm at the point where if I accidentally step outside without a mask, I feel like maybe I forgot to put my pants on or something. <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's probably very true. Uh, in fact, I think I did it once and I felt weird. Like I was like, man, what am, what am I forgetting? And I, you, know, you kind of really uh, understand that a little bit. Yeah, but better to do something, something small and simple for the common good than to just protest something meaningless as far as I'm concerned. So, Jeff, I, I really got to tell you something, and, you know, thank you. You've been a huge mentor to me in finding my true passion and becoming an evangelist. And we've done a number of live streaming events, recordings, and we always have the chance, you always make the time to sit down, chat with me, and do these recordings. So I have to tell you, I really appreciate it. You're, you're very welcome, John. I, I, I think that... It, at a certain point in your life, you realize you've 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 done something kind of interesting, and people like you for it. And it's really important to actually to share what you've done, the the secrets. And I I think it's very important to make sure that there's a next generation that is going to come along after you. And that at any point in your career, you a lot of people help you to get where you are. You need to turn around and then help the next generation of people to to be even better than than you were at whatever it is that you do. So. Happy to help. I'm very grateful and thankful for it. And I'm, I'm really proud to say that you and I have become good friends and chatting and periodically. And we do text uh, often. I got an awesome card from you for the holidays, which I really appreciate. It was very touching. You're so very I welcome. thank you for that as well. And, and you know, the, the interesting lesson here, John, is 
we didn't get any kind of formal introduction and there was no like special program that said, okay, John, meet Jeff. You just sent me a message that said, hey, I'm brand new to AWS, can we meet? And I said, of course, sure, let's do it. And there, there's, there's a real lesson in just simply taking initiative and reaching out. Yeah, no, I, I definitely also taking the time out for it on your, I know you're extremely busy. In fact, we were joining this recording and you were already up. Uh, you had a full day in and you're on the West Coast and it's 10 a.m. my time. And I was just like, oh, wow, Jeff's already on the roll, he, you know, hitting the ground running. Might as well get going. Now, jumping back to Deep Racer a little bit, I'm wondering if you had the chance to check out Swami's keynote right there at the end where AWS Deep Racer Underground made a special appearance in the video. I, I actually saw that and I thought, wow, this is totally, totally awesome that, that you went from a cool idea of I really want to do a deep racer in my basement to getting it set up to recruiting your family and making it happen and figuring out all the logistics and mechanics and little fiddly bits of hardware and software to make it happen. It's like, wow, that it's such a long chain of, of successes it takes to do that. And it was like, wow, that's really cool. It has truly grown. If you missed Swami's keynote here, I'll put a link right up here that you can go ahead and watch the full on video, but I'll also put an additional link within the description below that will cut right to the deep racer part, which, you know, it's really touching that we've come so far in the last eight months. And in fact, AWS Deep Racer has grown so much. I'm hoping for bigger and better things this year. A lot of live streaming events, virtual events, even physical racing events, and I've got a couple more coming up in the next few months that we are live streaming with David Smith out in the UK, who is my co-founder here of AWS Deep Racer Underground. So, you know, definitely stay tuned to watch that. You know, related to this, all of these tools that we're using every day, we have just tremendous personal power where even this video work would have 10 or 15 years ago, we would have needed a video crew and multiple studios we would have needed a huge amount of equipment, a lot of very specialized expertise. We would have been in studios and we would have been stiff and uncomfortable because it's that's the way you get when you get into a studio. But here we are doing this and we pretty much self-produced it. It's it's really remarkable. It's uh, I would say it's a little more relaxing for us to do it here within our homes. Uh, something we've been doing periodically, and we're getting a lot better at it, but you don't have that stress and you don't have somebody saying, wait, cut, time out, wait, no, restart, you know, take 34. You know what, we're going to try this all in one take. They would be trimmed up a little bit here and there, but you know what? It's all about the fun and we enjoy doing this. It, it really is. And the thing about a video studio is no matter how relaxed you are when you're there, when, when you actually analyze it, every Every camera, every set of lights, all the audio equipment, and all the eyeballs, they all actually converge on you. And yeah. it, it, what, what, you can get self-conscious very easily. And then the, the lights are getting kind of warm. And before you know it, you're like, just kind of like, wow, this is really getting uncomfortable. Everybody's staring at me and <laughs> I am on take 34. Why can't I get this right? It's a lot easier when you're just in your own surroundings. That's very true. There's a lot of pressure is you know, when everybody's looking at you and be like, all right, you're wasting a lot of time and money. Why can't you get this first take, third take? Yeah. All right. Now uh, the lighting's on, off. Correct. I can make all those adjustments myself recorded here in my home office. Additionally, in my basement where I host these events, I have plenty of room for it. Uh, but, you know, exactly true. I think it I think they come across a little bit more natural. I think so. I've really enjoyed learning how to do all these things and getting the lights set up just right. And like, as we just discussed, there's always something new to learn uh, about this and like lighting and color temperature and shadows and a bunch of things I wish I'd learned and paid more attention to, like art class in elementary school of understanding how colors work and how light works and so forth. It's I, I was more of the, the technical and the math side always. And the art part never actually resonated with me. And I'm like, that would be the part I really need to know a lot more about now than, than I do. Well, you know, there's a great place for that, YouTube. <laughs> uh, no, no kidding, no kidding. Uh, I think I, I, I've kind of lived on it a lot lately, trying to improve my streams and the quality of them and finding out some of the best practices from various YouTubers <laughs> and promoting it and sharing some of that content. And, you know, a lot of my passion that I do 
is having these chats with various Amazonians, which I really enjoy. And if you guys want to take a look at a couple more, I'll put another link in the description below for the playlist. I have some awesome ones coming up. But YouTube is where I, I, I've kind of lived to find out the best quality or some improvements that I can do with OBS or the stream itself. Same here. And the, the reason I, I knew you were going to say that. And the reason I knew you were going to say that is because I've been doing the same thing. And that gesture of saying, I'll put the link right up here. No, 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 link right up here. Right? <laughs> <laughs> when, when you get the link, that that's such a, a power, powerful thing that you know that in post-production, you're going to put that link to to other content and then you need to point for the subscribe button and the bell and they're they're actually just expected parts if when 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 you put a good video together to just really put that that almost it's like it's not meta it's like breaking breaking the, the wall and saying i i know that i know where you'll be watching this video and let me let me kind of clue you into some context but there's there's so much great material on there uh, about any topic the the now, now to me, it's fascinating that the there's like the developer relations community that produces videos, some awesome, some okay, some like they could really use a better light and a better camera. But there's this entirely separate community of streamers that they don't seem to be aware of each other's existence. But you, you look at the view counts on any video that has OBS in the title gets tens of thousands of views, even on some esoteric topic which tells me there's a really good sized community of people doing this out there so you touched on a lot of things there which i think first of all yes pointing here or there you have to realize which side the it's called a card and the only reason i know this is because i had to youtube it and figure it out it, that slides up on the screen. So I had to realize that I'm pointing here versus pointing here which side does it slide out because if you're pointing it and you know, don't forget to like, subscribe, and really providing the value of how in that. If you ask my kids, the very first thing I ask them when they're watching a YouTube channel is to hit the pause button. I want to see how many people viewed this. Mm -hmm. I am very analytical driven, and I want to see the number of people who are viewing this, how long ago was it, and what the quality. Now, the entertainment uh, content definitely brings in more views than the technical content like theirs, but it's just interesting to see the number of views it, it totally is it's a good metric and i love the fact that that any, really anybody anywhere in the world that has something to share can can turn on their camera turn on the lights put a, a reasonably good show together and share it and there, there's there's really no gatekeeping and there, there's nothing in the the way of good idea to good content other than just actually doing it so Jeff, I'm gonna switch some gears here and I wanna talk about reInvent because reInvent was three weeks of just free virtual sessions, workshops and keynotes, which was the very first time it's ever been held. And it's a little bit different, but I think the positive is that we had a lot of people who could attend that normally couldn't attend in person. And, you know, kind of going off of that, there were so many features that were released, in fact, I think you were tweeting about a bunch of them daily, and I'm not sure how you kept up with everything, but could you share a couple of your favorites from reInvent or some also some feedback from reInvent and what you thought of it? Yeah, so it, it was a really intense three weeks for, for me. And the, the, the thing I loved about what was going on was that we were reaching a global audience. I, I don't know that we shared the final registration count, but I, I think the preliminary one was somewhere around half a million registrations. So that, that's far more than ever could have shown up in Las Vegas in person. But everybody around the world, as long as they were connected and they had a device and they had the, the personal motivation to learn, had the opportunity to watch live streams or to watch the, the recorded videos, I found it really gratifying just to see the messaging coming in from all over the world. And um, there, there's a lot of parts of the world I'm I'm kind of watching as effectively kind, kind of like emerging areas for developer advocates just starting to pop up. And I'm, I'm really excited about just seeing people from parts of the world I've just never seen just jump into conversations before and that are learning about AWS, they're building, they're sharing, and it, this is no longer a a US only East Coast, West Coast phenomenon at all. Like you, you can you can you can learn and you can share from anywhere in the world. And I, I love that. I love the fact that, that there, it, it's more accessible to more people and I it's 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 more fair, it's more generous, and it's it's gonna 
I think really deliver some great dividends in the, the next couple of decades. I think the value out of it is the growth and the full reach of reInvent was not isolated, like you said, to Las Vegas. It was globally available. And you think about it, it's this huge privilege to be able to take a week plus off of your regular job, fly halfway around the world, stay in a really expensive hotel, eat expensive meals. Not everybody has that privilege, you know. So, especially if you, you're a parent, you've got young children, you've got other responsibilities that you can't simply hit pause on for a week or a week plus. The, the fact that you can sit there and may, maybe all you're doing is watching on your your phone. Fine, you're you're nothing is stopping you from being as awesome as anybody else. And I, I I'm I always believe in growth and opportunities and education. And here 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 it is. Uh, as far as favorite things. Um, Let's see. I, I love the location service. I got to write the blog post for that one myself. Uh, the the making it really easy for our, our developer community to add maps and to do um, geolocation and to do uh, all the different kinds of things you, you do with maps and and locations with with routing in the works. Making a a, a simple business model, making it more cost effective for, for mapping. So really excited about that. I actually have an app that I wrote that's running on my phone that, that uses the geofencing capabilities. I, I, I've had a to-do list item for like a month to write a little blog post about that app and haven't had a chance to do it, but one of these days I will. Uh, hopefully this is the motivation for it because the Amazon location service, I think it was a really cool feature it added. And I was really surprised when they came out. I'm like, wait, we didn't have that? that was, that's <laughs> awesome that they have that. I like the geofencing idea uh, around it and, you know, get an alert when an item enters or leaves a certain geofenced area. Uh, I think that's one of the cool features about that because you can attach that to an item. And I read your full blog post on that mm -hmm. one. Keep in mind, everybody, I will add all the Twitter posts by Jeff and the blog post in the description below so you can read up on these services and we'll recap them they, later at the end. So, so location service, I, I love the Mac instances. I think that's a huge step forward <laughs> for our developer community. They they can, in addition to, the, the interesting thing is people at first saw that, oh, wow, I can have a Mac desktop in the cloud, but just if, if that's what you really want, you can do that. But the, the real audience for the, the Mac instances is if you're building for any of the, the, the various Apple devices, for, for tvOS or watchOS or, or for, your, for a, a phone or for Safari, you can put your whole CI CD pipeline onto Mac instances. So you can, you can build, you can test, you can code sign, all with instances running in the cloud. So it, it, it used to be a, a fairly difficult thing to, to really get access to Mac instances at scale for or just Mac, Mac minis at scale. So that's we, we effectively have Mac mini as a service, which you, you think is what we really have here. One of the things that I really liked from the, the blog post, there's a little video of David Brown uh, around the EC2 Mac mini instant launch. And besides the fact that having an EC2 instance for Mac, who wouldn't mind a truck full of Mac minis back yeah. <laughs> that that is scale in action is getting that that actual truck and being able to do it so excited about that and I, I know that as we were putting the finishing touches on that and getting ready to launch apple came out with with the next generation hardware with the the m1 processor and we, we've already committed to making those available as well oh that's interesting so you know i really got to talk to you about the ec2 mac instant launch there and because when that was released uh, i'm a mac person and all I could think about was live streaming, getting OBS Studio installed onto the Mac and possibly testing out an automated way for us as self-proclaimed evangelists to quickly get started recording and streaming content. So I, was, I was thinking about all kinds of ways and uses for this one, being a Mac person. I, I'm really thrilled about this release. I look forward to hearing actually what you get set up and, and going. I'm working out with, so personally, I have a personal thing to, to work on is that I want to make an automated way that we can deploy out a CloudFormation template that spins up the EC2 with the OBS already installed with profiles that somebody can go click on stream after putting in their key or recording and they're ready to go. And then you Ooh. shut it down and save all this money. Oh, yeah, that, that sounds perfect. So apparently the newest Mac version of OBS, the, the virtual camera is now functional. So I, I think that must have been a critical step.
for you there. There was a preview, a 26.1.1 preview that was available. It wasn't an official release that I found from OBS Ninja a developer, Steve Seguin. And I was playing around with that one and the virtual camera works with that one. The other interesting part is that OBS Ninja did not work natively with the Mac OBS software on that one. But the great thing is 26.1.2 everything works in fact there's newer versions of chromium on there than there are for the windows portion and which makes the mac obs studio uh just one step better better than the windows portion which i'm really thrilled about so we kind of recap obs ninja works natively the virtual camera works natively all within mac so with, with obs there's this rich ecosystem of plugins and shaders and then you create this video stream and use a plugin to route that into to something else. And then the OBS Ninja you referred to, that is the, you, you actually, you should go ahead and explain OBS Ninja. Uh, actually, I have the, you to thank for OBS Ninja. You did a, what was it? A community day for Australia and they were using it and you sent it to me and suggested, and I hooked up with the people in Australia who were testing it out and playing around with it. And if it wasn't for that tool, I would not be streaming today because it, OBS did not work natively with Mac or at least seamlessly. And I was trying to capture video and virtual cam and stream and it was bogging down my laptop. So, you know, whole story short is I have you to thank for putting me on the OBS Ninja and the developer for building something as easily accessible and free to use. Yeah, it's a very important I don't want to call it glue because I think that understates how awesome it is. It it plugs in. It's got all the right plugs and connections on both ends to do really amazing kinds of things. Yep, I agree. Now, going back to reInvent, what are some of the at least two or three other things that you came upon of your favorite releases? So I, I, I love the fact that we're making it possible for our customers to run compute and storage in more locations and different ways. And the, the two launches that just really excited me there were the expansion of additional wavelength zones. So, so wavelength is where we've been working with 5G carriers, both in the US and in other parts of the world to put EC2 and EKS and EBS in, into the, the 5G telecom provider. Um, there, there's a name for their data center. They call it something slightly different than a data center, but it's a, it's a data center on one half and it's, it's 5G telecom on the other. So the idea is we want to give developers the ability to, to build apps that half the app is running on a phone and that phone is going to be able to connect to with, with very high speed, very low latency, 5G connectivity back to a wavelength zone and access compute power. So if you want to do machine learning or if you need to do rapid data collection, robotics, maybe self-driving cars, you, you've got all, all this compute power accessible with single digit millisecond latency from, from a, a 5G connected device. So this is a neat thing that we're, we're really putting out there. We have some, I think, interesting ideas for how customers will use it. It's greenfield as far as what will act, what it will actually be used for. So I'm more than usual anticipating a lot of really neat and surprising use cases popping up from this. So wavelength zones, and then there, there, we really have, I think, this continued quest, if you will, to just get compute power closer and closer to our users. And the the other thing is what we have called a local zone. We we opened up the first local zone in Los Angeles last year. We added a second one in LA. And we announced a whole bunch of additional local zones will be opening up throughout 2021 in additional parts of the, the US. Again, compute and storage closer and closer to users. We, we're trying to get, the, we, we have internal metrics for a percent of the US population and latency that we're trying to get. We, we wanna get that to the majority of the US population by using local zones. You know, local zones were announced back in December, 2019. And you said, you know, obviously started in L.A. there now in Boston, Houston, Miami. They're all available for preview with plans of New York, Chicago. And I think the other one's Atlanta. I'll have to double check that one. But I think the biggest thing to take away from it is the single digit millisecond latency and, you know, how local zones, you know, what do we have to like come into like 15 locations? I think we committed to 15. We, we, we announced three and said that there'll, there'll be 12 more uh, as well. And that's, a, that's a really good ad there. Some of the use cases that I've seen for local zones 
are around media and entertainment, some of the things we get to play around and do, enterprise migrations, hybrid architecture. And the other thing that I'm taking a look at is real-time multiplayer gaming. So, you know, for me personally, I think of like, you know, streaming on Twitch and the gaming aspect or YouTube gaming, but, you know, this is really a huge use case. Totally agree. And so, so those are things I really liked. Um, I didn't get to dive as deep as I would like into all the different machine learning offerings that we announced, but just SageMaker alone, I think we, we announced just a, uh, just five plus different really awesome additions to, to SageMaker. So clearly machine learning is, is really important to our customers. One of the things I really enjoyed was an article that you shared with AWS Recognition, where an AWS DeepRacer community member put out an article around recognition and custom labels around the DeepRacer. Now they took over thousands of images of the DeepRacer car around the track, and they were able with 99% accuracy call out that this is a deep racer car. And the thing that they wanted to do was really utilize this as maybe the next virtualized track boss and then find out where the car might go off the track or it does go off the track and call it. And then the other additional thing is that they want to do it for timing as well. So here my mind's going is that there's a camera on top watching the car. If it goes off, it says it's off. That is a you know, reset and also count, you know, does a lap timing off of that. And there's one more feature on that one. And, and Jeff, I'm so glad you shared this article because something that I want to develop or work with the developers is, is think about the Evos and the head to head. You have two cars on the track. I wanted to recognize which car is whose and think of NASCAR where you have the label of the racer following the car on a live stream. Now, obviously we don't see it, but you see it following around and pointing out which car is which, and it just moves so seamlessly between that. So that's kind of one of my side projects that I want to work on. Sure. Maybe we need to actually have a, a little color, some colored LEDs on the car so you can tell them apart. What we did at reInvent is we actually took red and yellow tape and put those on the shells. Mm -hmm. so you can see the car on the black of the track, and you can see which one was which because you had the same shells. And it really popped for the last underground deep racer event that you were at. Ooh, so sounds awesome. Yeah, there, there's there's so much creativity within our community. It, it's always cool just to see that we we put these raw materials out there, and people take them and they they think really hard, and they have this awesome idea, and then they go ahead and do it. And it's like, wow, I never would have thought of that. But in addition to have them having them think of it, they actually went and, and did it, which can be even more difficult. Now, the last thing I, you know, I have to share with you is I enjoyed Warner's keynote inside the Sugar Factory, and he really told the history of the place while capturing the audience attention with important information. You know, the factory looked like it wasn't in use for years, but here it only was used periodically a couple of months of the year. But one of the things that he announced during it, which kind of resonated with me, is the AWS fault injection simulator. And it, to, if I could summarize this in one sentence, it's fully managed chaos engineering service. You know, a chaos engineering is the process of stressing an application in testing or production environments by creating disruptive events. What do you think about that one, Jeff? I think our customers are going to really get a lot of value out of this. So, so back in the earlier days of Amazon, one of our, our colleagues, his name was Jesse Robbins, and he had this, his business card actually said master of disaster. And so <laughs> Jesse's job was to break things. And what he would do is he instituted this practice around Amazon of something he invented called game days. And so game days were these periodic events where they, they would decide on some piece of the infrastructure to break or to stress in some way. And everybody would be standing by and watching all the metrics. And they say, okay, let's let's pull power to the to a load balancer or to a rack. Or let's let's disconnect part of a network and see what happens. And let's watch all the metrics and make sure that the parts of the system that we believe and fully expect to scale or to be fault tolerant, that they actually kick in and behave as expected. So game day, that, that idea of game days was formalized as chaos engineering. We, the Netflix came out with the, the chaos monkey and some other members of what they for a while called the, the simian army. And we, we then said, well, let's, let's do the fault injection service to take that to the next step, making it really easy for customers to, to introduce faults into their environment under very controlled conditions. So not, not just breaking something, but saying, 
I propose to break something, and these are the metrics that I expect to not be perturbed by, by this breaking. So to actually design and conduct an experiment. And then one of the neat things I've learned as I spoke to the team is ultimately the default injection service will have fairly low level access to internal parts of AWS. So slowing down API calls, making it appear as if an instance has consumed all of its available memory, various kinds of low level breakage that are a little bit difficult to simulate from outside, but with, with actual access to kind of the, the guts of the cloud, we, we should be able to introduce different kinds of breakage. I think that was an awesome ad for that one. All I can picture, and you you mentioned with Netflix, is the little monkey running around in the data center just pulling out all the cables and yeah. uh, turning power off and you know kind of playing around with that one. But I like the addition of doing some of the stuff that you can't traditionally do or have access to is you know slowing down API calls or making an instance seem like it's really uh, causing disruptive service within your environment. Yeah. Now, part of this is to really ultimately give our users confidence in in their ability to architect these very resilient yep. systems. You, you you can you can follow all the best practices. You can follow all of the well architected framework. You can believe you've done everything right, and you can say, "Yep, I'm I'm pretty confident this is good." But nothing is going to give you more confidence than trying to break things and and seeing all all of these all of these things that you that you architected actually spring into action and make sure that your auto scaling works as desired and that that you don't have bottlenecks in one place that you never would have anticipated and that the, the failovers actually do fail over in, in the time frame that you expected. I think this is gonna be something that might be added to the well architect. And this is just an assumption, I'm not putting anything out there, is like, have you injected AWS or utilized AWS fault injection simulator into your environment? When was the last time you tested this out? And it's just part of your whole backup DR and high availability scenario, in my opinion. Totally agree. All right. So, Jeff, thanks for that recap there uh, on reInvent and some of the favorite things and releases. Now, there was a lot that was released. We have, we're have we big fans of all of them, but these are ones that stick out to us. Kind of switching gears again a little bit here. You know, on our last, our last stream, we had a chance to discuss 3D printing. Now, Jeff, I know over the holiday, you were working on a special project and hopefully completing that special project, a 3D print of Discovery XD1. Correct. You want to give us a little background on this? And uh, sure. well, when I was about nine years old, I was so lucky that my my family we went to the actual premiere of 2001: A Space Odyssey, and I, I was the only one in the family I think who actually stayed awake and found this this movie fascinating and awesome. And I remember walking out thinking, I want a computer, and I really need a spaceship as well. And it, it, I managed to get the, the access to computers not that long afterward, but I never actually did get the spaceship. And sometime last year, I was browsing a, a site full of 3D models, a site called Thingiverse. And I, I just happened to see someone said, oh, I, I printed this discovery model and I, I did some more searching and I did, I did some, some uh, investigation and actually found a, a 3D model of the discovery. And I spent well over 200 hours printing. And I don't know if you've done much 3D printing, but that word actually underestimates how much work is involved. There, there, there's often scaling and iteration and some trial and error and a little bit of head scratching sometimes to figure out how to get things to work. But I, I persevered and let me switch over to my, my studio camera here. And there is Discovery XD1 hanging in a, a place of, of honor on my ceiling. So I th this was a whole bunch of separately printed parts printing them all out um, back to here. A after printing them all out, I, I went to a local metal supplier and I bought a, a 40 inch long steel rod. I cut it to the exact length I needed and very carefully threaded and aligned and, and then super glued each of these pieces into place. And it's like, this was really fun. And it, it's a wonderful conversation piece, but it was it's always fun to close these long loops of something that you you wanted when you're young and the, the world evolves in this really interesting way. and this whole idea of 3D printing and going from a cool idea to I've, I've got a physical one of them in my hands in in minutes or hours or weeks, whatever it takes is like it's it's a it's another really empowering technology. So I do I will share a picture with everybody of what it looked like during the holidays. And then, as you can see, Jeff had a chance to finish his long time life project here of his spaceship. Now he didn't get a full on real one that, you know, go <laughs> traveling with. But hey, it's the next best thing. I'm working on my own project with that one with an ATM mini. So it's a Blackmagic 
custom portable case that I have here. I have a full on blog post, how to build it. It's something I stumbled upon right around the holidays. And it, a gentleman had a video about it. I'm like, I've never soldered before. I've never done, done anything like this. And it was nice to have some hands on. Now I don't have a 3D printer. So my good friend David in the UK printed out the parts and shipped them to me. So I was able to do that way. I am pleased to announce that my 3D printer did ship yesterday. It is in progress right now. And hopefully I'll have it in the next week to start playing around. I got the same one as you, Jeff. You have a lot of fun ahead of you. And I, I would advise patience. There, there's, there's a, there's, this is an evolving technology and there's a lot of fine tuning to get everything to work just right. And for a long time, you're going to say, this is, this is not good. And why does everybody else get good quality prints? And I just get, I just get spaghetti. And <laughs> at, at a, once you get everything dialed in, it's nothing less than magic. And I, I love that. I, I down, I routinely download designs and I, I scale them up and I, I generate what's called the slice file, R run downstairs and copy it on the USB and put it on the, the printer hit go. And I, I used to watch it. And w one total word of caution is watching 3D printing is absolutely hypnotic. And you can sit there like ooh, 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 just watching it for, for far too long. I, I, I've actually learned that the best thing to do is to just put that USB in there, select print, watch it for a couple seconds and make sure it gets off to a good start. And then pr just kind of forget that it's going and then just go downstairs later and be really cool, surprised by the results that have actually popped up so you're you're not the first person who said 3d printing is mesmerizing so I, I have what i did is i have this table set up to the left of me it's a full-on workbench table where the printer will be I, yeah i'm pretty sure that i will be mesmerized and i'll be sitting here going if somebody would be like what are you doing i'm like oh it's printing sorry i got lost yeah so the the next thing to, to do is people will also put a webcam on the printer and the advanced way to do that is you put the webcam in such a way that it actually ticks up every every time the printer prints a layer that yeah. the the camera goes at the same level as the print head and you you get these really cool things that were, it just looks like the 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 thing you're printing it just like like liquid it just kind of appears out of nowhere as it slowly it's rises like, below the print surface there's only a cooler way to do everything and that's the interesting thing so that's interesting i didn't know you can do that with the camera i'm gonna have to <laughs> sorry <laughs> oh my god another idea you know what i learned something new every day and if i didn't i'd feel a little stale and i'm gonna have to look at that one and maybe youtube some 3d printing techniques of recording it and make, getting the camera to move yeah that there, there's plenty there is plenty so my, my youtube subscription list has like 10 different OBS tutorial producers and a bunch of 3D printing folks and and some and some good like uh, food bloggers as well. Uh, <laughs> we might have to do an episode on some of the food bloggers and some of the feedback you got there. Sounds good. <laughs> All right, so Jeff, before we wrap things up, do you have any current or upcoming projects or maybe hosting any events that you could or would like to share with us? Oh, let's see. Uh, no, no special projects that are underway that I'm ready to share just yet. We're, we're now in this interesting quiet period after reInvent where there's not a whole lot of big launches happening. We're, we're still we're still doing plenty of features. And in fact, after I wrap up here, I'm going to take a quick break and then start recording my my weekly what's new video. I haven't even looked at the list of the things that, we, that I need to include there. But we there, there's certainly the, the, January is always a bit quiet, and then February, March, things are going to really start to heat up uh, again. So, as always, it, it's stay tuned. We're, we're we're always listening to our customers and always ready to ready to build awesome things to address those great customer needs. As always, Jeff's working on some cool projects, or he's hosting or recording a couple of events. And in fact, a lot of people are thanks to you, Jeff, and some of the things we do. People are reaching out to me to do some of these hosting events. I'm like, I'm no Jeff Barr, but I will try my best. <laughs> Oh, I, could, could I do a, a book plug really quick? Yo, of course. Oh, okay. So my, my friend, Colin Breyer, who I was my manager for Wild Amazon, he wrote this awesome book called Working Backward. It's going to be launched in early February. This is a really impressive set of just inside stories from the early days of Amazon. So when we, people ask about our culture, they ask about why do we do PR FAQs and narratives instead of doing PowerPoints, they ask about how did you create AWS and Prime and Prime Video and Kindle and Fire Phone? Tons of great stories in this book. And I, it was one of those books where 
I'm not the fastest reader anyway, but I was reading it extra slow because it was actually, it was so interesting. Just, it was one of those, like, I'm going to savor this just to get all this really interesting information about uh, about how, how how we do things and what it was like in the earlier days. When is that coming out? The, the cover says on sale February 9th. Uh, I wonder, I'm going to have to check Amazon to see if there's some pre-order ones. I'd like to take a look at that one. The reason it is, I find how the Amazon Fire Phone came about very interesting. Really, that was a huge successful failure. And mm -hmm. the reason that is, is because what came out of it was Alexa. Yeah. And that is a really interesting story to me because of the Amazon culture is that you are encouraged to fail, but learn and to try and to build things. And you're not, you know, Actually, failure is a good thing here because it's what you've learned or lessons you learn and you're, you're experimenting. Exactly. Yeah, it, it's all in there and it's, it's well worth the read. And so that, that, that's what I really enjoyed. I'm reading another one right now called Ask Your Developer. That's all that's from the founder of Twilio and also super interesting. Jeff, I'm always interested in a good read. I've got a couple of them piled up between <laughs> the mystery ones, also some YouTube success creators, and this won't go next on my list. That's actually one of the things you get to do a little bit more here now that you're not traveling as much as you know, have some downtime to read and catch up on some things. Well, I, I would hope so, but most of my reading time was actually in airports and on planes, so I'm a little bit behind. Uh, well, mine was there too, but then I would find myself on airplanes working. I'd crack open that laptop and I'd start working because when I started to read, I'm like, I kind of feel tired. I want to take a nap. <laughs> yeah, very true. <laughs> so, Jeff, before I end this one, I got a special surprise for you. And the reason that this came about is because over the holidays, my wife had a special surprise for me. She Ooh. took my original AWS Blogger logo and she gave me some of these cool pens here. Oh, wow. All right, so I have this really cool. awesome pen, and there, but she only had five printed. Uh huh. And I just changed my logo. She didn't know about it. I was just kind of playing around with it, and I got to change. So these are collector's items because I'm not getting any more of these printed. Mm -hmm. I'm going to ship you one of these pens. So in years to come, that you will have a collector item of the AWS Blogger when I originally started it. Totally cool. Appreciate that. Uh, so they're, they're, they're really cool. I thought it was awesome. She also got me a plaque too. It's hanging on my walls to kind of <laughs> remind me where I started and where I'm coming from and where I progressed over this time. Th those things are really important. I, hidden back behind my, my green screen here, I've, I've got like a, a picture of myself with my grandfather when, when I was like five years old. And he was like a geek before being a geek was cool. Like he, he was the first on his block to own a, a television. And from there he said, Oh, I, I, I have one of these, I know how it works. And he opened his own television repair shop. And those little reminders of how you got to where you are, I, I think really important. Yep, I agree with you. If you'd like to see more of these blogger chats with various Amazonians, don't forget to check out the links that are gonna be at the end of this video or throughout the video, including my playlist on that. Uh, I try to do these often. I've got actually a dual recording tomorrow with Bill Voss. That'll be fun. That will be very interesting. And some of the topics we're talking about, including some of those edge services. Don't forget to ask him, ask him about quantum computing. Ask him about snow cone. Oh, man, don't, <laughs> you must be reading my script because let me tell you what. What I do is I put together a list of questions here that I have for him. Snow cone is one of those. But then in our second topic, we're talking about Lumberyard and quantum computing. So I can't Absolutely. actually wait. Sounds great. All, All right, right, John, I'm gonna run. I've got to get ready for my what's new video. All right, we're going to wrap this up. Jeff, thank you for joining it. I really appreciate it. I enjoy doing these videos with you. Enjoy the rest of your day and your what's new video. Will do. Great to see you, John. Yes, you too. See ya. All right. Bye-bye.